I just love how at any moment the Holy Spirit can can grab a hold of you and bring to remembrance the truths that are so essential to our Christian living. The fact that it's not about us, that it's about others, that it's about service, obviously, to the Lord. And that happens by our service to other people. And it's just uh, a blessing just to know that you hear from the Holy Spirit and the quietness of your heart and the stillness of things. And you can hear that that, that soft whisper that gently directs you in the right path. And um, it's just what a blessing. What a blessing to just have that personal relationship with with Jesus Christ. Well, good morning, uh, church. And we are uh, this morning going to finish off the book of Acts, uh, excuse me, the book of Acts in chapter 16. We're about halfway through and it's just amazing how this journey we've been on and all the the kind of the different things that we've been through since we started the book of Acts about a year and a half ago. And so i um, very pleased to, to see us coming to this point and um, excited for the message this morning. So let's just go ahead and go before the Lord and, and lift up uh, these requests and asking that he would intervene in, in our in our service in the message. Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you once again for your blessings in our lives. The fact that we can trust in you, that we know that you hold all things in your hands and that our security rests in you. Lord, our hope rests in your son, Jesus Christ. And how grateful we are to know that we have a, a true relationship with him, Lord we can be made right with you through the blood of Christ. And at any moment, whenever we are off track or sense ourselves going in the wrong direction, you will convict our hearts and you will turn us around. Lord, you're gracious enough to not let us destroy ourselves, but you give us a chance to repent. You give us the opportunity to have our minds changed and have our hearts renewed. And so we're grateful for that. Father, may you please be in this message, Lord. Now, we know you are, but we invite you in. That's what, you know, one aspect of prayer is, is to invite you into our lives. May you be the center of our lives. May you be the focal point. Lord, may all things in this message be revealed and point to the person of Jesus Christ and how he is the cent centerpiece, the cornerstone of the gospel message of the Bible, and he is our solid rock. So, Please speak to us now. May we be attentive. May we understand. May we be able to rightfully divide and discern your word and apply it to our lives. We thank you and love you. In Jesus Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. All right. We'll be in Acts chapter 16 going through verses 35 to 40. And I'll begin in verse 35. And it reads, The next morning the city officials sent the police to tell the jailer, Let those men go. So the jailer told Paul, The city officials have said you and Silas are free to leave. Go in peace. But Paul replied, They have publicly beaten us without a trial and put us in prison, and we are Roman citizens. So now they want us to leave secretly? Certainly not. Let them come themselves to release us. When the police reported this, the city officials were alarmed to learn that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. So they came to the jail and apologized to them. Then they brought them out and begged them to leave the city. When Paul and Silas left the prison, they returned to the home of Lydia. There they met with the believers and encouraged them once more. Then they left town. I've entitled this message, Integrity Under Pressure. And that's what we need as believers in Christ. We need that integrity, that, that integrity of character uh, under pressure. Whenever we are forced to compromise, whenever we are forced with any decision that could potentially lead us in a way to uh, not honor the Lord and His Word, we need integrity. And integrity comes to us in the person of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Last week we saw the magnificent faith that Paul and Silas possessed in Jesus Christ, despite being falsely accused, being beaten and thrown into prison, they didn't waver. They didn't blink an eye, no matter how difficult it was. They continued 
on in their faith and they kept their integrity under pressure. They were eventually given a pardon uh, from the Philippian uh, police. Uh, that's what we see in the text right now. And we're going to learn what happened in that. They didn't leave quietly. They quickly understood what they had to do. And they still were of service to Lydia and these new believers in Christ. Jesus remained the focus of their service and they made it a point to allow the Holy Spirit to lead them before they left. They also made sure that these government officials who wrongly accused them the first time and now when they found out that they were Roman citizens wanted to quickly remove them from the city. They wanted them to understand that they were not doing anything unlawful or wrong by sharing the truth of the gospel and that they in fact were Roman citizens and that they were wrongfully treated. Again, we see in Paul and Silas the great example of Jesus Christ being lived out. Like Jesus, they remained faithful and they endured unfair and harsh treatment all the while sharing the love of Christ. And that is what we as believers are called to do today as well. Uh, in Enduring harsh treatment, in enduring unfair uh, accusations while all the while not blinking an eye and keeping our integrity and being steadfast in the faith and continue to share the love of Christ, continue to pray and intercede for those that desperately need it in our in our homes, in, 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 our, in our city, in our state, in our country, in the world. There's several main points that uh, I'd like us to focus on this morning. And the first one is this. It is God who will ultimately justify you before men. Paul and Silas were treated extremely unfairly and unjustly. But in God's perfect timing, he vindicated the wrong done to his servants. It is only Almighty God who can work within an individual's mind and heart and engage them to consider a different perspective, meaning whether it's is the, the, the victim or the person that is causing uh, the hurt onto the person, the wrong done onto them. Only God can work in that individual's mind and heart. No matter what the reasons were for these uh, government officials and the Philippian police to want to release Paul and Silas from the city, the Lord made it possible for them to come to that decision. It was what the Lord had allowed. Even um, You even look at Pharaoh and everything that went on with him, as hard as his heart was, after all the plagues and after his first son was, was, uh, was killed, you know, uh, it was the Lord who allowed all those things to transpire. And then finally, Pharaoh's heart was changed to let the Israelites go. So we see that it is the Lord who vindicates. It's the Lord who justifies uh, individuals. The second main point is this. We must be willing to remain in whatever situation the Lord allows in our lives. And sometimes we may even have to forego our own rights until it is his time for us to move on. And, and we, we may, in fact, have to uh, forego our rights so that the gospel may be sent out. So Paul and Silas were beaten. They became prisoners. Then while they were in prison, they witnessed a massive earthquake that allowed the cell doors to be opened. Then they stayed instead of escaping and were used to lead this Philippian jailer and his whole family to Christ. Now we see that the Philippian police have decided to let Paul and Silas go free, but they're not quite ready to go yet. If it was me, I more than likely would have been like, I'm out. You're telling me I'm I'm good to go. I'm 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 out of this place. It's been very stressful. It's been very difficult. There's been a lot of crazy things that have gone on. I'm not going to look back. I'm out of here. But you see, Paul had great discernment. He realized, one, that the officials should be held accountable and apologize for their wrongdoing. He knew that he was wronged and they should be made aware that, that they did something wrong. The second thing was he recognized and discerned that the Lord still had encouraging to do through him in that city before he left. You see, because... For us, it's it's quite easy to, to serve others in the name of the Lord, and we do it with a genuine heart. 
But when one good work is over, it's easy for us to kick up our feet and pat ourselves on the back and relax for a bit and be like, well, we did our part. I I did what I was supposed to do for the Lord. Now, yeah, you know, I've earned the right and I'm going to have a little vacation and hang out because I've, you know, I've served the Lord. And uh, but the reality is we are only done when the Lord says we're done. And I understand, of course, you need to rest. I'm not saying go 24-7 and burn out. The Bible is clear that we are humans and we're frail. He knows that we're weak and we need a Sabbath rest. What I'm saying is we can't think we are done simply because we have recently been used by God for whatever his purposes were. He wants our lives, our our lifestyle to be poured out as a blessing to others. And since God is the potter and we are the clay, then he should determine when and when not the cup should be poured and when the cup should stop being poured and not the cup decide when it wants to be poured out. The third main point that we have this morning is this. We are never too busy, excuse me, to be an encouragement to other believers or any people, unbelievers as well. We are never too busy to be an encouragement. This final point is an extension of the last main point. It is born out of this idea that we are on God's times table and not our own. I'm I'm, I'm sure that physically, mentally, emotionally and spiritually, Paul and Silas were were tired. They were probably beat. They had gone through a lot. But I truly believe because they were relying and drinking from the living water, who is Jesus Christ, that they were spurred on to continue to be a great blessing instead of leaving town without a trace. And when you think of Lydia and the, and the, the great things that happened to her and her family being saved. I'm, I'm sure they wouldn't have cared too much if, if Paul and Silas didn't come back and say bye. I mean, Paul and Silas had already come to her home once and shared the truth of the gospel uh, after Lydia was saved in that prayer group. And so there was already a mighty work that had been done. But Paul and Silas were empowered by the Holy Spirit. And they, in a sense, went beyond uh just you know the the normal call they 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 did the extraordinary simply because they had the extraordinary living within them i mean they had the living spirit the holy spirit of god living within them and so they were able to do beyond what the norm was simply because they had the power of god in them to do so as christians we should be the ones on our jobs In our homes, with our friends, going the extra mile. We should be the ones that are putting in that quality effort and that time being extraordinary and great and considerate to others and for others because of the Holy Spirit living within us. Because we serve a great God, we are expected to have a great attitude towards being used for God's purposes. But unfortunately, many times we shortchange Jesus Christ by putting a cap on how he can use us. You all know, and I know, because we've all been there. We'll we'll use these excuses like, well, who am I? How can I be used by God? Or I I can't be used by the Lord. I I don't have experience, or I don't have the knowledge, or I didn't go to seminary, and I don't have these accolades by my name to to signify that I should be used by uh, the Lord in a great way. But this is where trusting in God comes into play. Because the reality is this, you can do all things, hear me, that honor Christ and we can do them well. He will equip you and I for every good work. That is, if we allow him to by submitting to his will. Amen? All right, let's go ahead and get into these verses starting in verse 35 and 36. And it says, The next morning, the city officials sent the police to tell the jailer, let those men go. So the jailer told Paul, the city officials have said you and Silas are free to leave. Go in peace. So at this point, we know that Paul and Silas had went with the jailer to his home. They stayed the night and they witnessed to this whole family. 
Now, after they were saved and this, you know, great event occurred in this jailer's home, the day after, the city officials sent some police to tell the jailer to let Paul and Silas go. In societies like this Roman society, where they recognized few rights for the citizens, it, it was it was super common for for someone to be, uh, you know, arrested, beaten, imprisoned, and then quickly and unexpectedly released. This was something that they did really to terrorize uh, the population into submission. I mean, if you had heard about man, my my brother, my uncle, my my sister, my cousin, you know, they they went through this harsh treatment. You know, you would be weary of, you know, stepping across that line or doing anything, you know, that would uh, bring bring about this kind of treatment to you. And so it was a way that, you know, societies would keep people in line and in check by doing this. And this is what happened to Paul and Silas. They were they were treated this same way. With the beating and the locking up of Paul and Silas, the government was trying to make an example of them. But unfortunately for the government here, it actually backfired on them because it did not happen the way they want. Uh, they wanted. Paul and Silas did not respond in the way that these government officials thought they were going to respond. The Bible doesn't give a clear reason for what produced this change of heart in the magistrates, in these uh, you know, government officials to want Paul and um, Silas to leave. But it was probable that they had been brought to reflect somewhat as the jailer had to do because of this great earthquake that happened. Their consciences had been troubled by the fact that in order to please the masses, they had to cause these strangers to be beaten and imprisoned without a proper trial, contrary to Roman laws. And in Roman society, this whole concept or idea of an earthquake, it always suited to sense some kind of guilt This that an earthquake was caused because people were guilty of some wrong that they've done. And amongst the Romans, it was regarded as an omen or uh, the fact that their gods were angry and so they the, their gods caused this kind of earthquake it was it would be understood as like uh it would produce agitation and it would you know it would produce remorse in the hearts of the roman citizens because again they they would believe that this earthquake happened because their gods were upset with them um i'm sure you guys uh you know experienced that uh that thunder and lightning the the other day right sunday late late saturday night early sunday morning well um you know at my house where you know when i heard it i mean it was so loud and so abrupt the first thing i did when it i mean woke me up out of bed is like honestly i i dropped to my knees (laughs) i dropped to my knees out of bed and i started praying you know because it's like what i experienced to me it was like that was just a glimpse of the power and the greatness of God, hearing that thunder crashing, you know, and the, and and seeing that lightning as bright as it was, you can't look at that lightning, man, it'll blind you. Um, but you know, that was my that was my instinct, that was my reaction was, you know, get to my knees and and pray, you know, and ask the Lord, uh, you know, not only for you know forgiveness, but for for protection and and it again, um, you know. I throw that in there because again, you know, every knee and every every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. At, at, at you know, at just again that little glimpse of that power of that thunder just causing that natural reaction to get down, not duck and cover, but get down on my knees and pray. Um, the agitation and alarm of the magistrates it, it it was shown were shown by the fact that they had sent the officials as soon as they they could the next day they were so fearful of their gods which we all know are not they're not the true and living god but they were still they were so afraid and, and guilty that you know of what they did that they sent these officials at once the next day the judgment of god are purposely suited to alarm sinners Though they thought it was their gods that caused this massive earthquake, it was evident that it was not their false demigods, but it was the true God of Israel who caused this earthquake. And ultimately, it was God who justified Paul and Silas before these men and set Paul and Silas free. A question. Whenever you are justified, 
liberated, or cleared from being wronged, who do you accredit your victory to? The truth is we should always give the glory and honor to God, for it is God alone who has the ability to work through a person in order to accomplish his purposes. When you think of someone on trial, right, wrongly accused of a crime, sure, the the defense attorney plays a role, as does the judge. But ultimately, who is the one who causes the conscience to work properly and a heart to be convicted and the correct Uh, verdict to be made. It is the Lord who has that ability to do so. Isaiah chapter 46 verses 9 through 11 tell us, remember the things I have done in the past, for I alone am God. I am God, and there is none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. I will call a swift bird to pray from the east, a leader from a distant land to come and do my bidding. I have said what I would do, and I will do it. You see, people, me and you, we are the instruments that God uses to accomplish his purposes on earth, even when those individuals are not living for God. He allows these things to happen, but out of them come his purposes. I mean, again, you think of uh, Joseph and his brothers and all the stuff that went on, you know, and ultimately, yes, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. All of the things that happened to him, being thrown in the pit, being enslaved in Egypt, then being brought to second in command so he could be used by the wisdom of God to make sure that uh, Egypt didn't fall away because of the famine and then his brothers being saved and his family being restored all that that bad happened but ultimately it was for God's purpose to prevail all right let's go ahead and look at verses 37 through 39 but Paul replied they have publicly beaten us without a trial and put us in prison And we are Roman citizens, so now they want us just to leave secretly? Certainly not. Let them come themselves to release us. When the police reported this, the city officials were alarmed to learn that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. So they came to the jail and apologized to them. Then they brought them out and begged them to leave the city. Because Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they had rights that were recognized because they were Roman citizens. And these these uh, rights, they were violated by the Philippian magistrate, by these officials who had allowed them to be beaten wrongly. Well, the question is, how could Paul and Silas have proven that they were even Roman citizens to begin with? Well, back then, I mean, much like today, you have some form of, of ID. They would have probably had a copy of some registration of birth which showed that they had the status of being a Roman citizen. To claim Roman citizenship falsely was actually something that was punishable by death. So if they would have done this and they were lying, they, they could have stood in line to be killed. But when the magistrate understood this, when the government officials understood this, they were filled with fear because it was a great offense to treat a Roman citizen uh, the way that they treated Paul and Silas, it was it was not it was not uh, something that would happen again. You even look at uh, the the um, the cross and crucifixion, right? Roman citizens were not permitted to be crucified, even if they were rapists, murderers, uh, you know, the worst of of, of criminals. They were not given. Uh, they were kept from the the cross and the crucifixion because it was such a, a a despicable way to die. Only people who were foreigners who were not citizens of Rome were allowed to be crucified like that. But one might question, well, okay, if Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, why didn't they reveal their Roman city citizenship so uh, you know they didn't go through all that 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 wrongful uh, mistreatment? Why didn't they do that? And the reality is. I can't answer that. I don't know. It is possible that they didn't have the opportunity, but it's more likely that the Holy Spirit directed them not to reveal it into a certain time. Because if you really think about the situation, had they not gone to prison, 
they would have never met the jailer. If they never met the jailer, they would have never witnessed to the jailer. They would have never witnessed to the jailer's family. And that whole situation would have never happened. The application for us this morning is this. Circumstances arise in our lives as opportunities for God to display his love and greatness through us. But if we're only focused on our situation and not Jesus Christ being with us in our situations, we will miss it. And that's exactly what what happened here is there was an opportunity, even though the circumstances were not favorable, you know, at first and they went through mistreatment, this mistreatment and this harsh These harsh circumstances opened up the door for great opportunity for the Lord to be displayed to this Philippian jailer and his family. What I do know in regards to, again, uh, Silas and Paul is I do know that it's not as it's not as important as our uh, our obedience like our rights we have rights but our obedience is more important to us following the will of God than our rights god may ask us to lay our rights down for the good of another person and in this case as we see in the text it was for the good of the philippian jailer paul and, and silas laid down their rights their justifiable rights so that this philippian jailer could be saved they could have easily left and they didn't leave they preached the the word to him and he was saved. First Corinthians chapter nine verse twelve tells us, "If you support others who preach to you, shouldn't we have an even greater right to be supported? But we have never used this right. We would rather put up with anything than be an obstacle to the good news about Christ." You see, Paul understood that sometimes you will need to forego your rights for the greater cause of the gospel going forth. Our greatest example of this is obviously Jesus Christ himself. He had every right not even to leave glory and come down to earth and save us. I mean, he could have simply easily pressed the reset button and started over, much like how the flood was, you know. God was frustrated with his creation and said, you know, I'm going to go ahead and wash clean this earth and start all over. He started all over with Noah and his family. Jesus Christ could have easily did this. And you think about it, when he did come to earth as 100% God, 100% man, he had every right to live and not die. He didn't if anyone who didn't deserve to die, it was him. He was sinless. He was perfect. He was the one who was holy and righteous. Yet he laid down his life for the sake of his creation. And the application for us is this. Again, there may be times we will need to forego our own rights as Christians for the betterment of the gospel being spread to others. We are, we are familiar with this concept. This is not something foreign to us. We should rather desire that a brother and sister in Christ or even an unbeliever not stumble than to secure our own rights. I mean, it's like this. It's better for us to give up some kind of luxury and a person get saved rather than for us to keep our luxury and a person's soul go to hell. Next, we see that the city officials pleaded with them, begged them to leave the city. They tried to make their problem go away by by quickly and quietly sleep, sweeping it excuse me, under the rug. But Paul refused to take his freedom and run. He wanted to teach the city officials in Philippi a lesson and to protect other believers from the harsh treatment that he and Silas had received. All right. Let's uh, look at this last verse here in verse 40. And it says, When Paul and Silas left the prison, they returned to the home of Lydia. There they met with the believers and encouraged them once more. Then they left town. And when, you know, I've, I, I've looked through this whole passage and I truly believe that service is at the heart of this message. It is all about service. Paul and Silas were there to serve. The Bible is clear in uh, the book of Matthew. The greatest amongst you must be a servant. That is the heart of Christianity. Service. That is what Jesus Christ 
does. He serves. He doesn't look to be served, but he looks to serve. And for us today, we need to be those that look to serve, not to be served. And and that can come in many forms. I mean, something as simple as, you know, cleaning up after someone else cooks, uh, you know, just being of service, not, not looking for anything to be done for you, but how can I be of service? How can I help? How can I be a blessing to someone else? But also to serve and to serve joyfully, not begrudgingly, not doing it like, oh man, I have to do this. I mean, it's such a burden. I'd rather be doing something else. But, you know, with the joy of the Lord in your heart, knowing that this is you fulfilling your purpose in this earth is being a, a, a vehicle and a mechanism and a person, an instrument of service and an instrument of service to the Lord, excuse me, and for his people. When they had left the prison, they were directed by the Holy Spirit to go back to the house of Lydia before they had left for good. Only after they did this did they agree to leave. The Lord had more ministry for them to do. The Lord wanted them to encourage these new believers once again, one more time, for them to be supported, for them to be blessed by the presence of Paul and Silas and how the Lord would use them in these young believers' lives. Paul and Silas would not be hurried out of town until they had brought their work to a conclusion. The application for us is this. We can never be too busy to think that our service for the Lord is ever done. It's easy to right, develop this mindset of living off of past blessings, living off of old blessings. Oh, well, we were used by the Lord to do this in the past, and we did great work six months ago, and you know, a year ago, and you know, 15 years ago. I remember how great it was, but you know, what, what's going on currently? What's going on today? What's going on this past week? How has the Lord used you in a mighty way? What are the things that, what are the benchmarks that you see in your life that shows, man, the Lord is using me, and I know that. I'm being used by the Lord on a daily basis. We we should be able to recognize that and these things should be able to easily be pointed out because we are believers in Christ. There are good things that we've done in the past, but we have to understand that the Lord loves new works. As long as we are living on this earth, Jesus Christ wants to do new and exciting and bold things for his kingdom through our lives. We can't Live off of old blessings. Just like Jesus said, you can't put new wine in old wineskins or else the old wineskins are going to burst. You need new wineskins for the new wine, right? And in that, he was talking about the old rituals of the law, that they're dead. And, and the new life of Christ is here. And part of that new life in Jesus Christ is ongoing encouragement through the body of Christ. As the word says, iron sharpens iron. We we are supposed to be those that are used to be in encouragement and influence others for their betterment, for the good of the gospel, and especially in this context with other believers. And we need that in, in this pandemic and what we're going through, what we're living through. We need that as believers in Christ to be checking in with one another, to be spurring one another on in the faith, to encourage one another to continue and to not give up hope and to not fall behind, but to continue to press in to the Lord and be encouraged to trust in Him. Amen? But there were there were two specific converts that the Bible spoke about in in this uh in this last portion of chapter 16, and I'll and I'll end with, with this. We had Lydia and we have this prison guard. Each of these people had two different lives touched by Jesus in two very different ways, but ultimately it was for their betterment and for their good. We have Lydia. Now, Lydia was a faithful churchgoer, so to speak. You know, she knew of the Lord and she prayed regular, regularly, so she was seeking the Lord. That was Lydia's disposition. The guard you know he he had nothing he had no interest in the true and living god if anything he was a roman citizen who obviously worshiped the demigods of 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 rome so he was not seeking the lord in any kind of way lydia lydia obviously was a seller of purple so she had a prosperous business and she lived a fruitful life you look at the guard well 
in his situation, he may have had money uh, and he may have been somewhat well off, but ultimately he was about to kill himself. That was his position, his disposition in this circumstance. He was about to take his own life while Lydia lived a, 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 a good, prosperous life. And by no means was she about to kill herself. She was, you know, living a life that was very prosperous indeed. The next thing is that Lydia's heart was greatly opened her heart was greatly opened right while the guard's heart was violently confronted by this massive earthquake that happened but Lydia her heart was greatly open and gently opened by the word of the Lord that was brought to her a great contrast there the next is the guard had a remarkable sign of this earthquake that brought him to his knees while Lydia had the quiet move of the Holy Spirit in her heart, not that not that the quiet spirit of uh, the quiet uh, quietness of the Holy Spirit was not a remarkable sign as well, because obviously that is remarkable. We know that we can't save ourselves; that it's the Lord that has to come into our hearts to show us what is real. But it's the fact that you have this massive earthquake, and then you have this quiet whisper. Right, the Lord is in both of these things, but there is a great contrast there between the two. And the reality is this, both heard the gospel and believed, and through each of these individuals, both of their families were touched. The application for us today is this, there is, this is, excuse me, this is another constant reminder, right, that that all of us fall short of the glory of God. None are righteous, no, not one, no one is seeking the Lord, but by the same token, all of us all people are eligible candidates for salvation. It doesn't matter what your background is, whether you are financially successful or not, whatever your race is, whatever your class is, it doesn't matter. Or even if you oppose uh, God's people, even if you oppose uh, God, maybe you're an atheist, that doesn't mean you are not eligible for the gift of salvation. We all need the same saving grace of Jesus Christ, and He humbly, willfully, offers it to all men and women. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you again for your word. Lord, thank you again for your reminders that it is you who justifies us before men, that we don't have to try to avenge the wrong that's done to us for your word says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And uh, let us allow you to have your uh that you may avenge the wrong that is done to us. May we be those that humbly pray for our attackers, pray for those who accuse us wrongfully, pray for those who have caused harm in our lives, Lord, that we would want to see their hearts changed, Lord, as as when we forgive others, we are freed from that 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 burden of, of, of hate and, and malice, Lord, and, 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 and anger, Lord. We don't want to be those that hold on to that because that, that builds up within us and it harms us mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually, Lord. So thank you that you uh, are the one that, that justifies us before men. Father, we thank you that uh, you allow circumstances to come into our lives. And even though some circumstances are very harsh and hard, there is a purpose for it, Lord, and that and that purpose is that those around us that don't know you may have the opportunity to be saved. So for us as believers today, in the circumstances you have us in because of this pandemic and all the things going on, help us to see that there is a great resource in that, and that resource is Christ, and that we should be those that look to share Christ with those around us and not be stuck on our circumstances that we don't want to be drowned out by by the difficulty that we're going through in our circumstances. Thank you that you you walk with us through our circumstances. And Father, thank you that you show us that encouragement and service is at the heart and the core of the Christian life. May you help us to be those that are constantly looking to serve others, constantly looking to be an encouragement to others. Lord, we want to be used for your glory. We want to bring honor and praise and true worship to you by the way that we live. We know that acts of service are, are what you 
desire from us that this is something that we should be doing and living naturally not that we're earning any kind of favor with you because it's not about that but because of what has been done for us because we see the model of Jesus Christ and how he has such a heart of service to others that we would want to emulate that and we would want to be that way towards those around us so father we thank you for this message may you give us the ability to apply what we have heard this morning to our lives. May we be those that live this out. And we pray for those that don't know you, that they would come to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ this moment, that they would not wait any longer to give their lives over so that they may be reconciled to you, saved for eternity, and have the joy and the peace of you within their hearts from now until it never ends forever and eternity. We thank you and love you. In Jesus Christ's wonderful name we pray. Amen.